to be back here at Biola. Last time I was here was with a debate with Carl Guyverson, someone who I'll be mentioning, and that was fun too. Modern Americans are notorious for wanting to have it all. We want to have our careers, but we also want a decent family life. We want to have loads of possessions, but we don't want to be controlled by those possessions. Uh, we don't like to make hard choices. Uh, if you have any question about this, just look at debates over the federal budget or in California, the California state budget, which are great examples of trying to have it all. But really, sometimes you can't have it all, as I think even politically we're finding out. No matter how much you may want it, you can't have a square circle. No matter how much you want, uh, you can't have a bath without getting wet. You can't feel rested without ever going to sleep, although those of you who are college students might try. Uh, it doesn't work, believe me. Um, evolution is one of those things where lots of people want to have it all. They want to have evolution, they want to have God. Depending on what you mean by evolution, as Jay just discussed, that may be perfectly true and may be coherent and may work out. But as Dr. Richards also pointed out, if one means Darwinian theory, there are some huge hurdles to having your Darwin and keeping your faith in any sort of traditional sense. Indeed, the effort to promote what is typically called theistic evolution raises three big questions uh, for people of faith, particularly those of the Judeo-Christian tradition, questions that ultimately cannot be ignored. The first one is, did God specifically direct the history of life? Now, the traditional Judeo-Christian view is, yes, we and the rest of creation are supposed to be the product of a loving God who intentionally planned us. Well, Darwin's answer from the very beginning was no. He was very clear on this, and sometimes people think this is Richard Dawkins inventing things, but in fact, it's in Darwin. Darwin talked very specifically, there's no shadow of reason can be assigned for the belief that variations in nature were intentionally guided. Uh, he actually writes about the term natural selection is in some respects a bad one. He ended up preferring, actually, Spencer's term survival of the fittest later in his career because he says it might seem to imply conscious choice, but this will be disregarded after a little familiarity. That's not what he's talking about. Natural selection is an unguided, blind process. And in fact, it was meant to be a designer substitute. And if you don't take anything else away from today, but realize that this is sort of the core meaning of Darwinian theory, you will have gotten something important. As Darwin himself said, the old argument of design in nature, which formerly seemed so persuasive and conclusive, fails now that the law of natural selection has been discovered. So again, he saw the law of natural selection as a designer substitute. How you could get things that looked like uh, design or the things that were part of intelligent process through a blind and purposeless process. Now, it is important to say that in the early years, many of the people who embraced some form of evolutionary theory post-Darwin, many theologians and even many scientists didn't accept that view of evolution. They had the older view that actually Jay was just talking about. <clears throat> in fact, theistic evolution in Darwin's time pretty much was guided evolution. A good example of this is Asa Gray. Asa Gray is typically known, written about today by theistic evolutionists, as one of the most noted American scientists to embrace Darwin's theory, who was also a noted theist. He was a devout Presbyterian. What people don't often point out, especially the theistic evolutionists who write about this, is that Asa Gray, although he said he supported Darwin's theory, really didn't support the core meaning of it as a blind process, and, and he had all manner of debates with Darwin about this. In fact, by the end of his life, Gray was telling other people privately that he told a friend that his theistic version of evolution was very anti-Darwin, and those were his words. Things changed, however, after uh, the revival of Darwinian natural selection early in the 20th century, because for a while, even a lot of scientists had problems with thinking that natural selection could produce all the wondrous complexity we saw. So they accepted Darwin's theory of common ancestry, but not his, the idea that natural selection could explain it all. But with the rise of neo-Darwinism, the fusing of that with Mendelian genetics in the early 20th century, a more vigorous sort of Darwinian form of evolution did become predominant in the scientific community. And with that, really the task of theistic evolution changed. After the revival of Darwinian natural selection early in the 20th century, theistic evolution post that increasingly focused on trying to reconcile unguided 
evolution with God. And that's really what we see today, even people who might be called the new theistic evolutionists. Uh, Jay has already mentioned some of them. I'm gonna, John Polkinghorn, uh, Kenneth Miller, Francis Collins. And if you look at the writings of these people, for the most part, Francis Collins is a bit of an exception because he sort of goes back and forth. But largely, the mainstream proponents of what's called theistic evolution today are trying to argue for an unguided form of evolution, even while they hold theism. So you get things like in John Polkinghorne's writings, and he often uses this in his stock speeches, uh, an evolutionary universe is theologically understood as a creation allowed to make itself. Now that's a really different way of describing creation than say for 2,000 years of uh, certainly Christianity and also I'd say Judaism before that, creation creating itself. Or you get George Coyne, the former Vatican astronomer, who says that not even God could know with certainty that human life would come to be. And of course, if you're trying to preserve evolution as an undirected process, then that's right, God himself cannot know how it's gonna turn out. Or you have Ken Miller, whose book, Finding Darwin's God, is used in many Christian colleges, it was used in my college, Seattle Pacific University, to teach evangelical students about how to reconcile Darwinism with God. What's his view? Well, in that book he says, mankind's appearance on this planet was not preordained. We are here as an afterthought, a minor detail, a happenstance in a history that might just as well have left us out. Now, how does he square this with his theism? Well, he does go on to say that God knew that this undirected process was so wonderful that it would create something capable of praising him eventually. But what is, was that something? Well, it's completely unpredictable to us and to God. Well, just how unpredictable? I was actually on a panel with Ken Miller in 2007, and I had the chance to actually put this to him and push him on it. And his answer was, well, instead of a human being, evolution could have produced a big brain dinosaur or a mollusk with exceptional mental capabilities rather than human beings, and God didn't know which. Now, the point here, sometimes theistic evolutionists sort of twist this point and say, oh, God, are we saying, had to produce human beings with you know, two legs and homo sapiens? No, God didn't necessarily have to do that, but what they're saying is God didn't know what. If you view God as an artist, he's not Michelangelo, he's like a modern abstract painter who just throws a can of paint and sees what happens. This is a really different view of God. Whether you accept it or reject it, just realize this is a challenge to traditional monotheism, not just Christianity, but also Judaism. Well, that's not the only question raised by modern forms of theistic evolution. The second one is, did God create humans originally good? Jay alluded to this. In the traditional teaching of both uh, Judaism and Christianity, the cr original creation was good, especially human beings were very good. They were morally innocent. And then human beings freely rejected God, and that's how sin entered the world, and that's how uh, things, especially with human beings, became messed up. And then if you're a Christian, that's sort of the prerequisite of why you believe you need a savior in Jesus. And that, so this is very core to the Christian identity as well. Well, what do we get in modern theistic evolution? Well, this has to be dispensed with. Uh, for example, you have Anglican Bishop John Shelby Spong, who gave an interview a couple years ago, who said this, Charles Darwin destroyed the primary myth by which we had told the Jesus story for centuries. That myth suggested that there was a finished creation from which we human beings had fallen into sin and therefore needed a rescuing divine presence to lift us back to what God had originally created us to be. But Charles Darwin says that there was no perfect creation because it's not yet finished, it's still unfolding. And there was no perfect human life which then corrupted itself and fell into sin. And so the story of Jesus who comes to rescue us from the fall becomes a nonsensical story. Now, Spong is known for his heterodox views on a variety of matters, but even among self-described evangelicals, we find the same view. Carl Guyberson, who was here last year, is a physics professor at Eastern Nazarene University, a member of the Christian College uh, Coalition. He is vice president of Biologos Foundation. He wrote this book, Saving Darwin, which forward is written by Francis Collins, who warmly endorses the book. Well, what does he say in this book? He makes the same claim. He says, he directly rejects the idea, as he says, that sin originates in a free act of the first humans and that God gave humans free will and they used it to contaminate uh, the entire creation. That's out the door. He says, modern science won't allow us to believe that. Why is that? Well, it's because, in his view, evolution, how does it proceed? Well, it's not driven by 
mercy or uh, some uh, beneficial purpose. It's selfishness. Selfishness drives the evolutionary process. Unselfish creatures died. Selfish creatures flourished. That's what we were from the beginning. There was no original good creation, certainly no good human beings. And Carl Guyberson made very clear last year here at Biola, any of you who were here for that, that this is in fact his view. I was not misconstruing it. Uh, this is his view. This is from a self-described evangelical uh, who, uh, Jay mentioned the well-funded sort of uh, issues for promoting theistic evolution. Well, the Templeton Foundation, as I write in my book, has spent something like $20 million over the last decade on various groups to specifically promote what I would call theistic Darwinism. And, and so Carl Guyberson's book was actually helped funded by the Templeton Foundation. So this second question, you know, were human beings created originally good? Modern version of theistic evolution or theistic Darwinism categorically rejects that. And then we have question three, which is can we see evidence of God's design in nature? And again, the traditional Judeo-Christian view is yes, God reveals himself through nature. And that's in the Old Testament. The psalmist talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God. You have Jesus in Matthew talking about consider the lilies of the field, look at things like the sunshine and the rain, and he actually gives these as examples that we can learn things about God's character by seeing things in nature. And then, of course, the famous passage from Paul in Romans, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Very, very clear teaching in the biblical tradition, both Jewish and Christian. And then in the early church fathers, like Theophilus and early church fathers from early in the second century, write similarly, God cannot indeed be seen by human eyes, but is beheld and perceived through his providence and works. As any person, when he sees a ship on the sea rigged in, and in sail and making for the harbor, will no doubt infer that there is a pilot in her who is steering her, so we must perceive that God is the governor, of the whole universe, the pilot of the whole universe. Well, what sort of works was Theophilus talking about? Well, if you read his writings, he goes on to say, and really they were God's works that he pointed out in nature, in astronomy, really in the biological world, uh, in, in ecology, in the among animals, and in the rest of, sort of what might be called the ecosystem. So again, this is very clear teaching. Well, what do we get in modern theistic evolutionists? Well, those that don't deny outright that God guided things do try to come up with a halfway house, sort of how do we split the difference? And this really is maybe describes Francis Collins, as Jonathan Wells will talk about later today. For a large part of Collins' book, Language of God, he actually does talk about as if Darwinian, unguided Darwinism explains a lot about human beings, especially when it comes to something called junk DNA. But then later in the book, perhaps because he recognizes that this sort of position that evolution really is undirected flies in the face of a lot of traditional uh, Christian teachings, he doesn't fully embrace, say, the Ken Miller position. Instead, he comes up with his, his compromise position, which is this. Well, maybe evolution appears to be driven by chance, but somehow through the eyes of faith, we know that it's not. So, but from our perspective, this would appear a random and undirected process. This is what I call the cosmic trickster position that Jay alluded to. God is this great cosmic trickster that he creates a world that looks random and undirected, but through the subjective eyes of faith, we know that he's creator, even though all the evidence says to the opposite. Now, it's interesting to point out here that in a way, Francis Collins is further from, in, in, arguing this position from the traditional biblical view than arch-atheist Richard Dawkins. Because Richard Dawkins begins one of his books pointing out, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Richard Dawkins plainly admits that you look through nature and it's just shot full of evidence for design. It looks designed. But he says, because we now have evidence for Darwinian theory, that's a better explanation, despite the appearance of design. So Richard Dawkins says things appear designed but aren't, and Francis Collins is saying, no, 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 things appear random and undirected, but somehow through the eyes of faith, we know that uh, you know, God is creator nonetheless. That's a really interesting, I'd say, uh, uh, interface between them. 
Now, and, and again, though, this idea of God as a cosmic trickster is not quite as frontal an assault, I think, on the Judeo-Christian tradition as some of the earlier questions we talked about, but it still is really not in sync with it. And uh, it's, I think, probably hard to sustain. Let's now, though, talk, sort of as I end, I want to though bring up another issue or sort of sense of context. In, in many ways, the debates over modern theistic evolution, sort of theistic Darwinism, unguided evolution, parallel debates, fascinating debates, that the early church had. And I didn't realize this until just a couple of years ago when I started reading more widely in the early church fathers. And it's just fascinating parallels that there really is nothing new under the sun. And we could spend a lot of time on this. I go into this in much more depth in the two chapters that I wrote for this book. But I just want to raise here the challenge the early church faced from the thought form known as Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism was, is quite an expansive term and has lots of little esoteric meanings and little idiosyncrasies that we can't go into here. But for purposes of this morning, I just want to make the, the two points. Gnostics claim to be Christians but they raise two points that most of the, the church fathers, or certainly the Orthodox church tradition, ended up rejecting. First, they denied that the world was created good. Matter was sinful, we were evil to begin with. Well, who does this sound like? Well, this sounds like Bishop Spong, like Carl Guyberson, the modern theistic evolutionists who reject the fall and reject that things were created good. And that, that was the Gnostic teaching. Uh, the second teaching was that the Gnostics really denied that God created the world. Now, they didn't deny that there was a God, they didn't deny that there was Jesus, but they said that God himself really wasn't the creator because things were evil, so we had to sort of explain this with the idea, the pagan notion of a demiurge. As uh, Hippolytus said, an early church father, explaining the Gnostic view, for the demiurge, they say, knows nothing at all, but is, according to them, devoid of understanding and silly and is not conscious of what he is doing or working at. He himself imagines that he evolves the creation of the world out of himself. Whence he commenced saying, I am God, and beside me there is no other. Well, I would say that um, this sounds pretty much like the demiurge of the, the modern theistic evolutionist pretty much is natural selection. I mean, it's just a dead ringer. Natural selection is the way that, in some sense, Ken Miller would say, God created the undirected process of evolution, the undirected process of natural selection, and so it did the dirty work. And so you can sort of say that God directly isn't the creator, it's sort of this secondary process. Now, the really intriguing, sort of mind-blowing uh, part of all this is that this new position that Francis Collins has come up with, that he dubs it biologos, where he gets it from the logos, the Christ being the logos, uh, of God in, in John 1. Uh, if you read up and you find out that the Gospel of John was actually written to counter the Gnostics, specifically the teaching that I was just talking about. And the early church father Irenaeus talks about this. Uh, Serinthus taught, this was an early Gnostic, who the Apostle John was actually writing the Gospel of John against, according to Irenaeus. Serinthus taught that the world was not made by the primary God, but by a certain power far separated from him and at a distance from that principality who is supreme over the universe and ignorant of him who is above all. So again, Serinthus had this teaching of that you know, it wasn't God who was creator, God delegated it to this process over which he really wasn't in control of and that's who did the creating. This is why John wrote the first section of the Gospel of John where he specifically says, the word, everything, not one thing in all creation was created except through the word, which of course is Jesus, who's in the Christian understanding is fully God. And so this claim that God is not the creator directly, that he farmed out the process to this uh, entity over which he didn't have direct control is precisely what John is combating. And yet, in a sort of almost Orwellian use of terms, Francis Collins comes up with biologos and taking the term that was actually used to mean almost the exact opposite. And just very, uh, an interesting uh, point. So, by way of conclusion, um, I just urge you, if you're a pastor, or if you're a seminary student, or a student, or a lay church leader, to think about what are you willing to reject because modern theistic evolution is really calling on you, you really have to make some choices. You can't have it all. Uh, you can believe in evolution, 
depending on how you define it. But if you're going to try to square Judeo-Christian theism with uh, the sort of uh, theistic Darwinism, you're going to have to ask yourself some tough questions, like, are you willing to give up God's sovereignty over creation? And say, well, yeah, it really, he really didn't guide things. He really didn't know whether we were going to be big brain dinosaurs. I don't know, think we could all fit in here if we were big brain dinosaurs. Or something else. God didn't even know how evolution was going to turn out. Uh, we are going to have to reject God's goodness as creator and realize that we were botched from the beginning. And also, or reject God's revelation of himself through his creation and say, yeah, God left us in the dark so that things look like they're random and undirected. And even the atheists like Richard Dawkins who admits that things look designed, they're wrong. Things really look random and undirected and we just have to live with that. Um, and I guess the ending question here really is why? And Jay alluded to that. Why should we do this? And really the answer tends to be science says so. But what if science doesn't say so? You're gonna hear at the end of this morning from biologist Jonathan Wells, who's gonna share some of the other science on this topic. If science doesn't say so, should we really be wedded to uh, really getting rid of foundational beliefs if you happen to be a Christian or a Jew uh, here? And I think that is something that we all squarely have to face because not all ideas are compatible. You can't consistently hold uh, all ideas at the same time. And I would suggest that Darwinian evolution is one of those things that you cannot hold consistently uh, if you are a traditional monotheist. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.